Good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting, uh, March, I'm sorry, March, Monday, September 13th, 2004 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, I, I understand a number of you are here to uh, see presentation to Chuck Wilson, and that will take place in just a moment. But first, we will have the roll call by the town clerk. Chair Cliff Payado. Here. Council Backer. Here. Council Fritz. Here. Council Lynch. Here. Council McGinty. Here. Council Mould. Here. Council Roberts. Present. And the manager. Here. And the town clerk. Here. Okay, thank you. Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'm going to move down to the podium. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, everyone. Tonight, it is my honor. I have some, uh, some prepared remarks, which I must attribute to Mike McGovern, because uh, that way, if there's anything that Chuck doesn't like, Mike gets blamed here. Tonight, it is my honor to present the Ralph T. Gould Award. This award, established in 1986, was named for the late Ralph Gould to recognize his community service and subsequently to recognize those who provide community service in the same spirit as Ralph Gould. Ralph Gould was the first recipient. He and the 15 recipients since that time have given legendary service to our community, including helping the elderly, preserving the environment, founding the Cape Courier, and serving as volunteers in many capacities with the town and with the school department. Tonight, in the 18th year of the award, we add someone whose service in any single year would qualify him for this recognition. And this person has provided service to the community of Cape Elizabeth for over 40 years. As in other years, we also note that this award is clearly long overdue. The town is fortunate to have so many citizens to give to our community, and while our choice seems obvious, it is a testament to this year's honoree that his qualifications truly stand above the rest. This year's recipient is Charles F. Wilson, known to most as Chuck Wilson. Chuck moved to Cape Elizabeth and almost immediately joined the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department. In an era when the department was populated with the dedicated service of just a few long-standing Cape Elizabeth families, those families quickly recognized Chuck for his leadership potential. Time to join us in the Murray's. <laughs> I think so. I was the first refugee that was quite cheap. <laughs> <laughs> in just a few years, he rose to company officer positions, and in 14 years, to become the chief of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department in 1977. In 1980, he stepped down as chief and served seven additional years as deputy chief. During his time as chief, he prepared the first detailed procedures manual for the department and brought much professionalism to the purchasing and personnel procedures within the department. Yet Chuck's service was not exclusive to just the rescue company and the balance of the fire department. He served five years on the Zoning Board of Appeals, including two years as chairman. He was secretary of the Civil Service Commission during a busy period for that group. He was president of the Cape Elizabeth JC and founded their very popular Cape Day, which led to the current Family Fun Day. Chuck served on the Municipal Facilities Committee, which eventually led to new public works, police, and fire facilities in the late 1990s. Recently, he served as chairman of the Cape Elizabeth Refuse Study Committee and is the only non-RWS board member on the search committee for the new RWS general manager. He has also been a valued member of the Cape Elizabeth Tax Cap Task Force this past year, where I've gotten to get to know you a little bit. 
Chuck has also served in a number of positions that have focused on the youth of our community. He's a past president of the Cape Hockey Association, a former Cape Elizabeth Little League coach, and was a corporator of the Portland Boys Club. He has served as well beyond Cape Elizabeth as a director of the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Chamber of Commerce, as a director of the Maine Chamber of Commerce, as an officer of the Maine Grocers Association, as a director of the Maine Economic Research Institute, and was a longtime member of South Portland City Managers Business Council. Now he did all of this while still giving time to his wife, his patient wife of 39 years, Alice, and to his two children, Jim, who is now the captain of the Engine One Company, and Tracy, who has also followed in her father's footsteps as she is now serving as a research associate for Hannaford. Chuck, in addition to his family and community commitments, also had a phenomenal career with Hannaford. During his 31 years with the company, he led their insurance and safety efforts, directed their warehouse operations, and served as vice president of government relations. In these capacities, he was a key player in the development of over $72 million in warehouse space. He provided great input in transitioning Maine's broken workers' comp system, and he helped to make Hannaford one of the most respected businesses in Maine and one of the leading companies in the retail food business in the United States. Now this long review has listed many responsible positions that Chuck has held that clearly have taken much of his time over the years, yet the full listing does not convey the complete Chuck Wilson. Those that know him best think first of his importance. <coughs> they also quickly recall his business acumen, his pursuit of fairness, his belief that there is always a better way to accomplish a task, his willingness to speak out on unpopular issues and to respect others' opinions, which I have seen in my work with you on the, on the tax cap group, and the great sacrifices that he has made for others. On behalf of the entire town council and all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, it gives me great pleasure to present Chuck Wilson, the Ralph P. Gold Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members of the council, for this very nice honor. I did it, a lot of these things, because they were the right thing to do. Um, I learned very early in my life from my parents that your community was only as good as what you gave to it. If you sat back and waited for the community to do things for you, then you were probably going to miss a lot of opportunity. I really thank that this award should go to my wife. <laughs> uh, she actually... <laughs> All those many nights that I was out, uh, those snowstorms when there was no power and stuff, I was off to the fire department. She was home with two children. Uh, any number of occasions. And, uh, Miraculously, we've survived 39 years of marriage. And uh, so I think because she really understood the importance of uh, giving back to the community. And uh, my family, my son and my daughter, and my daughter-in-law, and my grandson, <laughs> who is going to be the sixth generation firefighter <laughs> at some point. Maybe a gig in Mother's uh, Best Will. But thank you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to contribute to the town, and I appreciate the recognition. Thank you.
I forgot to mention also that there is a large plaque which will go up on display in Town Hall showing all the recipients of the Ralph Gould Award and Chuck's name will be inscribed on that. Thank you. Okay. I'll just pause for 30 seconds here so people can clear the room, anyone who wants to take off. Yeah, there's, there's more food back there. Thanks to um, Hannaford Brothers, they provided a very nice reception for Mr. Wilson before the council meeting. Okay, well that was a, one of the pleasurable duties of being chair and now we're on to the more mundane things. Um, reports and correspondence. Any counselors have anything to report? I have a couple of quick items. Councilor Mole. Uh, Manager McGovern and I had the uh, distinct pleasure of attending an Eagle Scout Court of Honor over the weekend, which I'm sure we'll be mentioning again at another town council meeting. But I want to congratulate Keegan Toot for achieving the rank of Eagle Scout. And just a few weeks ago, Andy Marston, another Boy Scout here in Cape Elizabeth, also attained the rank of the Eagle Scout. Only 2% of all Boy Scouts entering the scouting program ever attained the rank of Eagle. And I think that was a great accomplishment and testament to the, some of the great programs we have here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, also had the distinct pleasure this afternoon, just before coming over to the meeting, of watching our JV football team uh, beat Trace Academy 44 to 8. So that was, that was a good thing to see. And speaking of football, I hope people come to the football games this fall. The football boosters are currently running a raffle. They're raffling off a Jeep to raise money for their program. Uh, it's $100 a ticket. And if you watch Channel 3, you can see the contact numbers. They're going to be raffling that off this Saturday. So I uh, hope people will look for that on the, the town channel and come out and support the sports programs here in Cape Elizabeth. Thanks. Great, thank you. Other reports and correspondence? Okay. Um, the town manager's report. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I just wanted to briefly report. Uh, I don't know if everyone's aware, but every month prior to the council meeting, on the same day as the council meeting, we have meetings of the department heads and also a group called the Personnel Advisory Committee, made up of uh, a representative from each department so that we can have an, a, a frank exchange of views and concerns that they might have and you know, share, different, share different interests. I'd like to relate to you a little bit of what's occurred at today's meeting. Uh, I mentioned the second meeting first, the, the department head meeting. Part of that session is we asked all the different departments to report of all the different activities. And you know, while we didn't talk about it this morning, the, the planning board I don't think has ever been more active. They had six or seven agenda items uh, this past month. Public Works has been getting an awful lot of calls about drainage concerns, about when is my road going to be paved, about when is heavy item pickup week. Uh, obviously, like everyone else, the grass is growing a lot more than we, we might like as a result of all the rain we've had. We're getting a lot of calls. The police department activity is, a, is up five to 10%, mainly because of domestic violence issues. Which, which they're working through, as well as through call, people call that they see items of, of a suspicious nature. And interestingly, it's not only apparently busy in Cape Elizabeth, but we're also doing about three calls a week to South Portland now to assist them uh, with, with similar issues. So it gives, gives you a sense of, of the different activities. Uh, here, here in the town office, we're getting at least 20 calls a day now with questions about absentee voting and with questions about uh, voter registration and other issues of the upcoming election. Uh, the Thomas Memorial Library uh, had over 400 students, they reported uh, today, uh, at the summer reading program. An interlibrary loan is up over 100% compared to a year ago. And I could go on about all the different departments and the different activities, but it's, it's interesting that our services have never been more in demand than they are now. And just to cite one final one, the community services program. Last week, over 2,000 individuals signed up for community service programs. 
either the youth soccer activities, the other uh, Saturday morning activities, all of the adult programs, uh, the after school enrichment, over 2,000 separate unduplicated individuals. I asked Sue to calculate how many different sessions that is that folks are actually attending. And it ends up that during this fall period, it'll be over 22,000 sessions that, you know, that they need the attendance list, that they need to keep track of who's going for, and that they need to make sure that each and every one of those customers is, is taken care of. Uh, the personal, so that, that was just a little bit of what was said at the, uh, the department head meeting. At the personnel advisory committee meeting, uh, one of the issues on the agenda was that they were updating me on some of the things that the employees are doing on their own relating to the tax cap. Uh, Terry Olson, who, who wasn't here today, was the chairman, had actually written a letter based on a meeting she had been updating some of the, the other folks. And one of the issues we get into was uh, the potential employee layoffs as a result of the tax cap. Uh, through the, the efforts of the tax cap task force, we've identified 17 employees, 17 positions on the municipal side potentially be laid off. Uh, at that meeting, you know, they're asking when the layoffs might occur, you know, those types of questions. And then I, I just happened to ask out of the blue, and I'm not really sure why, because uh, I was unsure of the seniority in the room, how many of them were among the ones that were due to be laid off. This was Susan Sandberg at the Cross Memorial Library, uh, Jason Allen, who works for the Department of Public Works, Phil McGoover, the fire chief, and uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, one more. Oh, uh, uh, Pat Fowler, who works at, at Community Services and uh, part-time at the library. And in answer to the question, who was going to be laid off, every hand of every person in that room went up. And it, it just strikes, strikes me when I hear the, the radio ads and when I hear the other activities and then when I hear the department heads of the demand of services never to be greater, to see the, the information that's being put out there that we have scare tactics and that this isn't a real situation. Nothing could be further from the truth when you're sitting in a room and you ask who is going to be laid off and you find out that every single person is on that list, list to be laid off. So even if some things do happen, no matter what, you know, I think we can see it's, it's a very tense situation now with everyone being asked to do more than they've ever done at the same time looking down at the possible threat of a uh, of layoffs and, and other actions. And I, I know, you know, folks perhaps don't want to hear that, but it is the real world and it is the world of municipal government today. And I hope when all of the citizens look at all of the information on this tax cap, they do realize that they're talking about real people and they're talking about services that they are in fact using every single day and looking for more every day. So that's my manager's report this month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to come forward to the podium? Hearing none, we'll move on. The minutes um, to be approved the from the meeting of August 9th by your motion. I move approval of the minutes of August 9th. I second. I moved and seconded discussion. Um, I, I'd just like to compliment our new town clerk on the minutes. They're very well done, very readable, and it just, I know she's using a different format a little bit in terms of bold face type, and I personally find it very reader accessible. So I just want to compliment you and thank you. Nice job. Any other discussion or comments? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Next, we move on to item number 340405, which is carried over from a previous meeting. This is action related to Paper Streets and Shore Acres. Um, it was tabled on August 9th, so I guess we need a motion to remove it from the table. So moved. So moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous to take it off the table. Okay, item number 34. Uh, would the manager like to speak to this? Yes, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, very briefly, this item has been back and forth to the council for over six months now. It was referred to the planning board. The planning board came forward with a recommendation. There was a uh, public hearing held 
last month, uh, a lot of comments were received. Uh, I think the, there were a couple of outstanding issues last month. One involved some agreements that uh, perhaps needed to be signed with some residents who I, who I see are here this evening. Uh, my understanding is all those agreements uh, have been signed and, and uh, have been squared away. Uh, the, and, the other, so, and that mainly involves the Overlook Road and the Katahdin Road extension issue. In addition, there was an objection raised, and you may have seen an email today from Dr. Met, or Metty, M-E-T-T-E, -E, uh, who lives up on uh, Overlook Lane, and his concern is, is a little piece called Elizabeth Road, uh, which is, if it, as you look there, it's the white strip in the, the, the uh, northeast quadrant. Uh, the, the issue with paper streets is once they're abandoned, uh, they're abandoned, you have no actions, and generally it's been the past practice of the council whenever there's real objection to, elim to eliminating a paper street, the bias has always been uh, not, to, not to abandon that paper street. So I, as, as you look at your packet and you see the, the, the order that uh, appears in the packet that uh, Mr. Hill, the town attorney, uh, prepared, uh, I would suggest that you, know, that you give Elizabeth Road very special consideration and uh, perhaps separate that one out uh, because there is uh, a clear objection to the abandonment uh, of Elizabeth Road. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Um, so perhaps it would be in order if someone is to make a motion, if they would like to perhaps split the motion so that we have one having to do with Overlook Lane and Katahdin Road and perhaps another one to do with Elizabeth Road or, or just not dealing with Elizabeth Road. Do I hear any motion? Councilor McGinty. Um, I move that we um, abandon, no. abandon uh, Overlook Lane and Katahdin Road extension as described in the order that's in front of us, unless you'd like me to read the entire thing. No, I think that's Assuming not as, necessary. Assuming, as the town manager indicated, that all parties have agreed to the uh, terms of the order. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded, and I neglected to ask, I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who uh, has any bearing on this, but um, is there discussion on this? Uh, I guess I, I just have a question. I had um, talked to the um, town planner earlier today about Katahdin Road, and I understood there might be still be an issue about whether 50 feet was uh, the, the proposal before us is to reserve 50 feet so that we are not vacating a 50 foot portion of Katahdin Road and I understood there was some concern that might not be a long enough reservation and, um, and the number I had heard was 75 feet so I wonder if she could address that before we take a vote on this. Got the town planner at the podium. This is uh, Katahdin Road extension right here and both this property and this property have a driveway that comes through here and it forks off in either direction. I used our aerial photos and, and measured off the distance from what I, what I thought was the edge of the right of way and I thought 50 feet would do it. Um, but Mr. Keneally came in to see me and looked at the photos again and, and we kind of came to the conclusion that probably 75 to 100 feet would be a little bit better. It would, it would wipe out any chance that we're vacating anything that has any little bit of driveway in it. So I would suggest that at the, um, the motion here where it says uh, 50 feet, you substitute 75 feet or 100 feet um, at your choice. And that would be at the bottom of the first page. It's three lines up from the very bottom where it says commencing 50 feet instead of 50. Do you have a recommendation as to whether, in your professional judgment, 75 or 100? 75, 75 should do it. Okay. I would amend my motion to include it and make that 75 instead of 50. Okay. Second. Okay. As well. second. okay. Any other questions for Ms. O'Meara while we have her here? Um, I have a question for the manager. Um, would this, when we do this, the property then becomes, or the streets become, the sole property of the abutters of the streets. So I guess the question I have is, will this um, increase their lot size and increase the taxable value 
of the property. And the reason I ask that is we're giving away something that the town owns for no cost. And so the question I ask myself today is what's the town's interest in giving away um, this property in abandoning these rights? And it struck me that I guess the town's interest is in increasing the property value and um, thus increasing some um, income to the town. Um, otherwise, I can't come up with a good reason to provide additional property um, without getting something back for the town. Does the manager want to address that? I'll, or I'll, our assessor's I'll, here? I'll briefly address it because I don't want to put the assessor on the spot yet. Um, yet. Yet? Yet. <laughs> well, I think maybe we can avoid having them put on the spot. Uh, first of all, when paper streets are abandoned, it's not an immediate situation. There's an appeal period, and so it isn't, it isn't immediate. Uh, you know, the appeal is anyone in the subdivision has standing to, to make an objection. Uh, beyond that, assessments are, are determined by front footage as, as well as basically what, what a lot were. You know, a lot sells for X. It is not always the case if you just add a few square feet that it adds proportionally that much to the lot. If it's, if it's a buildable lot or if it's not a buildable lot, it's still a buildable lot. You know, Mr. Losher here, if he was to sell his property, uh, and, and he's, he's not too much affected because the 75 feet next to his house that's apparently not being abandoned, it, it does not add substantially. He already has a home there. He already has every other you know, benefit of, of that lot. It does not add a substantial amount. You know, the assessor has the right to go back and to revalue all those. I don't know if he's going to as an agent of the state. That's up to him. We, we don't direct him uh, in that regard. Uh, but if it, if it adds any value, it, it tends to be minimal unless it makes a lot that otherwise wasn't buildable suddenly buildable. And in each case, as he looked at the situation on April 1st of each year, he would make that determination. And my understanding is that in this particular case, there is, we are not creating any additional build, buildable lots. Any other questions or comments? Okay. How about uh, we vote? All those in favor of Councilor McGinty's motion as amended to saying 75 feet instead of 50 feet. All in favor? Unanimous. Are there any other motions that anyone wants to make about Elizabeth Road, or are we just going to move just on? The question, I guess, what do we do with Elizabeth Road now? It just, it just ends. Unless somebody else comes forward at another point. All right. So we don't have to do anything to just keep it as it is. It wasn't part of the motion to adopt it. It's a dead end. Okay. So it's a dead I, I went through my paperwork. I couldn't find any, affir any affirmative reason that, that, that people want, anybody wanted to do anything. So, okay. Well, then we will move on. Thank you very much. The next item is item number 44. And was this tabled from last month? Yes. So we need a motion to take it off the table. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded all in favor of taking it off the table. One, two, three. Okay. I'm sorry. It's unanimous. <laughs> See hands going up and down. It's unanimous to take it off the table. Okay. Um, and I will uh, just ask the manager just for a brief intro so he can update us. Um, the, the agenda was as of last week and he can just update us as to what's happening yeah, I, if anything yeah let me uh update you generally on what's happening with the lot next door because you know it's come up on the agenda a couple times and i think folks are curious as to as to what's going on and while a lot of it's a private activity it's not a public activity it does have public ramifications because i have been signing extensions along the way to the purchase and sale agreement granting uh extensions uh Paul Woods in his development company, which I forget the exact name of it, is it ISIS Development? ISIS. 
ISIS development company, uh, purchased, signed a purchase and sale agreement uh, for the property, uh, went to the planning board, got site plan approval for a new building there and, and related improvements. Uh, back about four, maybe four years ago, and I don't remember the exact date, the council was trying to be neighborly to what was then the apartment house on the other side of, of the service station lot here. Uh, in trying to be neighborly, uh, we, we, it had been discovered that they were using the town's property as their sole access to their, as their driveway and their sole access to the parking lot in back of the apartment. Uh, we worked with the then owner of the apartment house who was very relieved that uh, the town granted a right of way to him for $10,000 in compensation uh, to access the parking lot in the back. Uh, he was very happy, we were ha very happy with it. As part of that provision, it says that within the easement area, they, there shall be no parking. In the process of the planning board approval and the site plan approval, that was not noted by, uh, by the applicant, by the developer. And in fact, eight parking spaces are shown that park that are in that easement area. Uh, so what happened was uh, Paul Wood approached the owners of that sense that building since become a condominium with four different condo units. He approached the owners over there. Two out of the four condominium owners have only owned the property during this calendar year. They, they very recently bought the property. Uh, they were very concerned to find out anything was going to happen next door. And what's happened is, is that he's met with them probably four or five times and everything seems to be resolved and then every time he tries to move forward there's some new issues of something that they want to, to have. Uh, to give you an example, uh, you know, he, he has agreed to plow their driveway, plow their parking lot long into the future. He's agreed to have them use his dumpster on his property long into the future. And, you know, now there's, there's more requests that involve, you know, indemnifications and uh, paying for attorney fees and apparently, and the list got longer today. Uh, Mr. Woods has instead decided, he, I think he's reached the point that he can see that, that every time he gets them about ready to sign on the dotted line that it, it goes somewhere else. So he has, uh, he's going back to the planning board and he's going to take those parking spaces that are in the back and part of within the ordinance you can have compact car spaces. Some of the ones on that side of the building are going to be converted to compact car spaces and with, within the ordinance he can, he can get all of the approvals for the existing building without any way interfering with that. And I, I should mention there was buffers and trees and there were all sorts of other issues as well. But he, you know, that, that he was addressing. But anyway, so the plan is he's going to go back to the planning board to try to amend the site plan approval to totally, in essence, have those folks that benefit from that easement be fully able to use their easement uh, as is. But, you know, be, you know we've, all, we've plowed it the last few years. You know, no one's going to be plowing it this year. Uh, and, you know, they're going to be on their own because, you know, they just haven't been able to come to an agreement. And you know, that's what happens when, when, you know, folks negotiate something. One side can agree, one side can agree. Unfortunately, I mentioned this publicly, uh, you know, it's a little awkward because it's between two parties, but a lot of people are wondering really what the heck's going on when they don't see anything happening. And I, you know, there's no reason not to publicly disclose it because it's going to be very obvious, uh, you know, right now we've already begun the process of reapplying the complaining board. So, and it relates to this agenda item because in one of the things the council had some discussion of from the very, very beginning when the council was looking at selling the property, is what would happen with the proceeds. Some of it would be used for tax relief, to replenish surplus funds, and there's, there's always concern when we sell property, we ought to look into land acquisition activity. So that's why it relates to this item, that's why it comes up. So that's the story of where it now stands. ISIS development is going to be apparently coming back to the planning board, so it seems to have reached an impasse uh, with the neighbors, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens as it goes through the planning board process to amend the site plan approval to uh, take care of that uh, Thank you for that update. But if I might say one thing, it's exactly why, in the last Paper Street issue, why you always have the bias of not abandoning some right. 
Here it is, we were being neighborly, giving some rights, and we're being, you know, we, that property with the purchase sale agreement for $233,000, and we've been waiting for $233,000 when someone who is benefiting from an easement we gave to their property, not the same group, but someone who's benefiting from an easement of their property is now standing in the way of, of you know, what I would consider to be progress and something that the community supported. So uh, it's unfortunate, but it, it, it just says that when we, we deal with property transactions, uh, how careful we need to be, and I think Mary Ann's, you know, point of raising, you know, the concerns of this, you know, obviously is on target because uh, you, you do have to be real careful when you're, when you're giving up rights and you know why you want it. Um, I will turn this over to Councillor Lynch since she is the one who had asked this item to be placed on the agenda. And in light of the fact that um, the intent um, was to use some of the proceeds of um, the sale of the lot next to Town Hall um, in order to um, do the Jordan Farm Development Rights Acquisition, um, and we don't have those proceeds. Po point of information. The, that some people were interested in doing that. Some people, okay. Not that, that not I'm an sorry. explicit yes, I don't, I did not mean to suggest that everyone was, but some of us were. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But, but nonetheless, since there are no proceeds yet <laughs> to, um, to do anything with, um, I, I thought it would be in order to table it, and I would suggest that we table this for approximately 90 days till de our December meeting so we can not have this come up every month and and it still isn't resolved so let's just put it aside for three months and table it till december and hopefully by then um paul wood will, and the town will have closed and we can resolve this other no. issue i'm sorry so my motion is to table it until the december meeting second it's been moved and seconded there is no discussion for uh, motions to table so all in favor of tabling it and for three months until the December meeting. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Um, item number 450405, resolution on tax cap proposal. And Mr. McGovern, did you have some copies that you yeah, were going to provide? Yeah, this is the um, They were, they were in our folder. Hang on a second. Oh, no. Oh, in our folder. The email didn't have them. Sorry, same I didn't. They're the same as the email. They're the same, same as the email, just in, <laughs> in bigger print, so those of us <laughs> who have trouble with small print can read them more easily. Okay. Um, I guess I can introduce these. Uh, the council has been talking uh, for several months in, in public session um, about, uh, and in more detail at a workshop we had uh, approximately a month ago, I think, about um, adopting resolution regarding um, having to do with tax relief and more specifically having to do with proceeds on question the question one proceeds that we hope to receive as a result of the vote that took place in June, the statewide vote that took place in June. And um, I had the manager draft uh, something which is, well, originally went out with a packet that was sort of long and we, we added in some other pieces that seemed relevant. And I got some feedback from um, a, a number of the counselors uh, that it was a little complex having all these different ideas put together in one long resolution. And so um, the manager redrafted with and then ran it by the council chair, myself, and we ran it by our resident wordsmith, the finance chair, Councillor Backer. And um, so th what we have come up with is three separate resolutions. Is there anything you'd like to add to this, Mr. McGovern? No, okay. We have three separate res draft resolutions in front of us that um, we have before us tonight. And I guess I'll go through them in order because it is my hope that we could have separate motions and separate votes on these and that way everyone will know what we're, what we're voting on specifically. Um, it, would someone like to make a motion on the first one? Well, I'll make a motion. Okay, Councillor Lynch. Um, 
I will move that we adopt the following resolution. Resolved that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council urges a no vote on the Pulaski Initiative because its statewide passage will result in chaos and confusion due to the initiative's unclear and unlikely constitutional language, a loss of decision-making control at the municipal level, and substantial adverse impact on the ability of towns and cities to provide adequate municipal and school services to their residents. Thank you. Is there a second for that? A second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Councilor McGinn. I'm going to be voting against this resolution for a couple of reasons. Um, and uh, I remember what they are. <laughs> uh, one, the, the first one I brought this up at the tax cap task force meeting is how hypocritical we kind of are that we, not as a council collectively, but individually, um, supported question 1A in June that provided money from the state for education funding. And at that time, we had no concern about a loss of local control from receiving state money. And now suddenly, we're concerned about potentially receiving state money. And anybody read the Portland Press Herald this morning, there was an article there regarding <clears throat> potential for state money, revenue sharing, or state subsidy to school to be sent down to municipalities. And concerned whether, whether or not that would come with strings attached. Um, but suddenly, uh, you know, we're concerned about this, and I think that's somewhat hypocritical. Um, I also, and one of the issues I discussed the other day with the chair, in the original resolution talked about uh, there would be layoffs. The town manager alluded to it earlier, and as I told the uh, chair the other day when we discussed this, that I'm not sure I would agree with the places people are concerned about layoffs, or even if there would be layoffs that those decisions have not been made. Uh, there may be substantial cuts in other areas, uh, capital improvements or other, I don't know. But to simply start saying that we're going to lay off the, uh, you know, 17 people, uh, that's a possibility. Uh, it may even be a recommendation that comes through. But whether I would vote for that or not um, remains to be seen. And the third thing about scare tactics, um, you know, we're already engaging in them. Uh, we had a request from one of our citizens for a pedestrian safety sign at the crosswalk, uh, who, uh, a lady who um, is concerned about her children crossing this crosswalk. And uh, this is not a significant exp expense. I discussed this with the uh, public works director. And regardless of the merits of whether the sign should go there or not, that's a decision to be made, I guess, by maybe the police chief and the public works director and the town manager. Um, a response from one of our town councilors was that um, the impending Pulaski referendum vote, um, because of the impending, uh, impending Pulaski rep referendum vote, there was no money at this time that I could see being devoted to this effort. Although the Pulaski effort doesn't affect this year's budget, and there is sufficient money in the traffic sign um, account that account is a $5,000 account, out of which only, to this date, $26 has been spent. So I think, I, I consider that to be somewhat of a scare tactic, to start saying that we don't have money to do things today, um, when, in fact, we do have the money. So, for those reasons, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of neutral on this, I haven't taken a position one way or the other, and I believe that the council should remain neutral on this. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Mole. This matter of supporting this resolution is not because of what is how that resolution is worded, because I don't believe that chaos and confusion will ensue if Pulaski is voted in. I think we could have chosen other words for that. Oh, we have volume on the microphone. That's good. <laughs> um, but because I don't believe that the Pulaski Tax Cap Initiative is the solution to the problem. Um, if we're looking for meaningful tax reforms, we should be looking at Augusta to stop spending the way they're spending. We should be looking at Augusta to make a better business climate to increase the economic activity in the state so that they can give us back 
dollars to our municipal subsidies, to our school subsidies that they've taken away from us over the last several years, which is the real reason our town budget has continued to climb, why our tax burden has continued to climb. Uh, we used to get 30% of our school budget funded by the state just a few short years ago. Now we're down to 10%. So if residents are seeing their tax bills going up, 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 that is one of the reasons because of what's not getting done properly in uh, And I don't need to mention that I'm running for state representative, but this is why I'm running for state representative, because the problem is Augusta, not locally. Before I came on this town council, like many residents, I didn't realize how well run our town was. What a great job Mike McGovern, Mike McGovern does in controlling costs, keeping things very efficiently run. And I don't see the Gillespie tax cap in Cape Elizabeth being a, um, a method of improving the situation. Uh, our residents get good value for the tax dollars they pay in. If they want tax relief, they need to look towards Augusta to help the town because I could go into a long explanation as I did with Councillor uh, Chairman Payada earlier on what a good value they're getting for the tax dollars that they're putting in, how it's how the good school system, good fire, police, and other services that we provide to our residents result in the doubling of their property tax value of their of their property values in a five and six year period. Uh, if Pulaski is passed. The detrimental effect will be to erode property values, erode those services. To what benefit? For I think we saw earlier in some of the documentation, a typical house is only going to save a few hundred dollars a year. And yet, the fees you're going to pay on a typical house are going to be much more than what you're saving. It's just not, it's just not a good bargain for the residents of Cape Elizabeth. So that's, that's why I'm supporting this resolution, although I think it could be, could be worded a little bit better. Thank you very much. Are there other comments? Jeff? Thank you. Um, I'm going to support this particular portion of it, although I did want to respond, I guess, to a couple of comments that Councilor McGinty made. Um, as far as the referendum and the state uh, providing 55% statewide, and again, Cape Elizabeth won't get 55% of their education uh, costs covered by the state, but the mandates and the strings are already in place. Uh, they're already uh, so by getting some if, if we get any additional dollars at all out of the state that, that would in no way mean that we're going to have more control coming out of Augusta on education they've already got those in place they don't need extra dollars to give to us to put that in the and the other comment um, I guess that John indicated that it would not affect this year's budget and I'm not so sure of that I believe if Valeski's and the referendum passes uh, there are going to have to be some steps taken this year's budget to uh, meet the challenges of the coming years as well. Um, so for that reason, I am adamantly supporting number one. And again, I'm not sure the language is quite where I would perhaps want it. I hadn't looked at it until Mike had brought it up that way, but uh, but it, it, it sends the message we want to send. Other comments? Councilor Fritz. Um, I'm going to support this resolution opposing um, the Pulaski tax cut. Um, I, I really appreciate the tax task force that we um, um, put together, uh, having a lot of citizens come together that were a tremendous variety uh, of opinions and some different uh, aspects of the community. They really helped educate me and I think all of us um, about the ramifications of this tax cap. Um, it, was, it was really good to attend most of the meetings that they had. Um, I, really, I really do think it's the wrong approach. I think we have attempted over the last, while I've been on the council, to put some caps on, um, on spending in the town and, and to have some control to have, say, community services um, be a self-supporting program. Um, and 
and, and I think the manager has been just really excellent in keeping the personnel, having a, an efficient um, system of providing services for the community. I, I, I really think that the things that we do in this community, that uh, we, the services that we provide are the services that are the closest to the people and are the most important uh, to their lives. Fire, the police, the school, um, roads, all those things. Uh, I, I really think the cap on spending at this level is the wrong place and, and the wrong way. Um, others, like Massachusetts with their cap, is, is, is a higher cap and, and they have local overrides. I, I don't think this is the proper um, way to cap spending. And, and I really think that most of our increase in property taxes is from the federal government down with mandates, the, low, the state government with mandates, a very unfair school funding formula for uh, coastal towns in, 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 in Maine, um, and, and the mandates, as I said, from the state and federal level, uh, things that make us spend more money to build our police station. Um, even the community centers cost more because of mandates at the federal level. I mean, even something that we got in the paper or in the packet just this last week, um, something that I favor, which is recycling televisions and com computer mo uh, monitors, the state is saying we have to provide the cost of collecting, transporting, um, and they included in, in the bill that companies would pay for um, recycling, but they, the state statute didn't include that the cost of transportation is the town. They just <laughs> mandate that we have to pay that cost. Um, so all these costs keep pushing the uh, property tax up, uh, but I don't think our spending is up. So anyway, I will. Um, I do not favor the property tax cap, and I urge Okay. Are there, Councillor Lynch? Um, Carol, I'm glad you brought up the DEP. I hadn't planned to bring it up, but I have to at least mention, because I chuckled when I read it, it was Ray, Maine's shared responsibility program for computer monitors and televisions. And so I immediately said, okay, how are we sharing this? And it looks like the local municipalities and manufacturers and recyclers have the burden. And as far as I can see, the only responsibility the state bears in this shared responsibility is sending out the notice telling us what we have to do and giving us more mandates. So, um, and, and therein lies the difficulty, but I get off point. Um, I do support this resolution in which we're urging the citizens to vote no on the Pulaski tax cap. And I'll tell you here's wh here, why. Last April, um, in the anticipation of this, we formed a citizen task force that you mentioned, and I want to speak a little more about it because that was a very nonpartisan, um, widely um, diverse group of citizens that came from all neighborhoods, all age groups, all political backgrounds, and we asked them to take a look at what the impact would be if Pulaski passed. Um, and it goes to this issue that some are charging us with uh, using scare tactics and saying that the sky is falling. Well, that citizen task force made up of uh, goods, I think it was anywhere from 25 to 40 volunteers over all of the meetings, met two times a month from April. And I'm not sure, John, you were at all of those meetings that they um, worked hard at to come up with a list. Um, so this isn't my scare tactics. This is a lot of very thoughtful citizens working very hard on this issue. Um, so what did they conclude? Their conclusions were in the Cape Courier last week. It was a pink sheet that they had in the Courier. They concluded that, yes, property taxes will go down. There's no question about it. 
They also concluded that the town and school services will sustain major cuts. They identified what they thought some of those cuts would be, although we all recognize that we don't know exactly what those cuts will be until the town council were to act as Koleski passes. But among those things that they identified were a 33% reduction in town employees, um, which would result in reduced police and fire and um, emergency coverage, um, library hours reduced by 50%, a reduction in road maintenance, and um, I dare say snow plowing. Um, pool um, will either be closed or will be charging large fees, um, fees at the transfer station, fees at Fort Williams, um, 46 teachers and support positions will be eliminated for a 20% reduction in our school. Uh, um, school department class sizes will be increased. The school day could be shortened by an hour. And the list goes on. Um, again, this is a nonpartisan group of citizens. They did not conclude one way or another whether this was a good thing. They just said, here's what we think, and we think it's up to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to um, decide for themselves. Um, but I, having read this and knowing what I know about the town budget, I think it would be very bad news for our town and bad news for our state. Um, also, I feel as an unpaid elected official who doesn't stand to lose a job, I don't have any vested interest in this matter. I'm motivated only by my passion for this town, my love of this community. And so I think it's very important for us to speak out and take a stand on this issue. And in my view, the tax cap will hurt our town. And John, I wanted to address your last issue, which was to, um, that you said that it was hypocritical um, to support the June 2004 school funding and to oppose Pulaski. I mean, I think to the contrary, we used to receive a much larger portion of, let me, let me finish, okay? We used to receive a much greater portion of our school budget from the state. We send the state millions and millions of dollars. The June referendum, in my view, was all about getting our fair share, just getting our fair share. But this tax cap is about a lot more than that. It will take away our local control because it won't let us raise the money that we need to provide the services that our citizens want. That is a very different issue. Yes, there are some concerns with having the bulk of our school funding come from the state and having more mandates from the state, and we're going to get more mandates, more shared responsibility kinds of mandates, but um, for me, the big issue was in June, it was returning some portion of Cape Elizabeth residents' tax dollars and giving us our fair share. And the Pulaski proposal is, is about taking away any local control. So I don't think it's hypocritical and I don't think it's inconsistent. And I will be supporting this um, resolution and I will be spending um, every day between now and November 2nd um, trying to let Cape Elizabeth people and, and the people around the state uh, know that this is really a very bad idea. This is a four-page piece of legislation. It's not one page. It's not one line. It's not just about 10 cents and your taxes are capped. This is four pages of fine print, and I just encourage the people of our town and our state to read all the fine print. Thank you. May I respond to that, where she turns my name? Certainly. Um, well, first of all, I didn't equate, when I said hypocritical, I didn't equate uh, a, being for the June um, uh, question as, as opposed to, and being opposed to Pulaski. I said using the issue of loss of control. I didn't say for one against the other. I just said we didn't use the issue of loss of control in one, now we're using the issue of loss of control. And as far as the uh, the I would call it salmon, not the pink sheet you referred to. Um, you might also indicate that that task force included no money from the uh, June referendum um, as regards to what relief we might get. So when you talk about 46 school personnel 
they didn't include any potential monies from that referendum. And, and, and the reason that they didn't, John, is that no one knows yet how the state will fund that. The state may end up taking all municipal revenue sharing dollars to fund it. So, but that's my point. How, how can moreover, you vision without having the well, figures in front? Moreover, my point. Well, moreover, well, I think they were very clear in saying there is no way to know exactly what will happen. But here's what we we do know based on a four and a half million dollar cut in revenue. So, um, is it exactly precise? No, no one said it would be, but. I, I want to give these citizens a lot of credit. They spent countless hours in this, in this room all through the summer working on this every other week. And um, they, they did a darn good job of looking at the impact on the town. And it's hard for me to believe anyone could read this and come away and say that this is, will be a good thing for our town. Councilor Backer, do you want to weigh in or not? <laughs> Well, as everyone knows who has gone last in speaking on any issue, the problem with going last is that there's not a whole lot left to say, especially when we have as many eloquent people as we have on the council who have seemed to have touched on all the bases. Um, but so just a couple of very short points. One thing that, that Marianne um, didn't mention in her excellent summary of what the tax cap task force um, did over the course of the last few months <clears throat> was it tried to determine and quantify what the realistic dollar loss would be to the Cape budget. Um, and sort of the best case scenario number that the task force came up with, meaning um, what is likely to be the, the smallest loss to the town based on an assumption that a portion of the law will in fact be determined to be unconstitutional by the main law court, that the expected loss will be about $4.4 .4 million. And as this year's finance committee chair, it seems to me to be a, a mathematical impossibility that we can run the town and provide police, fire, roads, trash, parks and recreation, um, building maintenance, infrastructure, library, and education with $4.3 million less than, we've, than we're spending this year without a significant loss in the quality of services at the municipal level, at education, um, and without some loss of jobs. And I know that nobody has quantified exactly where those will be or how many they will be, but it seems to be impossible that there will not be uh, people laid off on both the school side and on the municipal side. Um, there was an article in this morning's paper interestingly enough, that I'm sure everyone read, that there are a number of legislators who have recently suggested that if Pulaski, the Pulaski Initiative passes, that the state will step in to provide funding to towns and cities to help fill some of the gap lost in the revenue uh, from the loss of property taxes. And the question is, where is that money going to come from if the state provides it, with the state already um, in a budget uh, crisis? And the answer is it's going to come from more taxes, whether it's a combination of income taxes, sales taxes, business use taxes. A loss of one tax will be replaced by other taxes. So it will not be whatever savings people see at the front end from a reduction in their property taxes may not be made up dollar for dollar in other taxes, but there will be increases in user fees and other taxes that will be felt. Um, towns and cities will need to keep their services running. People want good services. People want excellent educations for their children. And um, the Pulaski Initiative is not a panacea. With regard to the notion that a vote, the loss of control issue was somehow inconsistent with 
the June recommendation by this council. Um, I see the June issue being one of bringing money into the town and this being an issue of a direct loss of funds from the town. And I don't see it as hypocritical at all. I see this as a real loss of control because we are losing funds and our ability to direct how they're spent. In June, we were directing the state to bring money in, um, actually increasing our funding. So for all of those reasons, um, I also uh, will support this and urge the citizens of Cape Elizabeth to vote no on the plus gain issue. Thank you. Councilor Mould. I make a, since I just I didn't know we were going to have such in-depth discussion or else I would have made more comments. Well, <laughs> go to it. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't plan on making fine. comments on this tonight. And I always get myself in trouble when I do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, because I, I wanted to relay to the citizens the discussion that we had had earlier on, you know, economically, why I have some, some issues with the, the tax cap. Uh, In a town like Cape Elizabeth, where our mill rate is approximately $15 per thousand, which is one of the lowest mill rates of any town around us, and is partially due to the fiscal restraint that we have practiced over the years, uh, our housing values have been going up 15% on average per year for the last five years. Uh, houses in Cape Elizabeth have doubled in value over the last five or six years. Pulaski is asking us to cut back to $10 per thousand instead of the 15 that we're currently at now with some adjustments for debt, et cetera, like that. Well, if you have put in $15 per thousand and your house value has doubled over a five or six year period and you were to sell that house or God forbid you were to pass away and leave that house to your heirs, in that time frame at one and a half percent per year, you're still reaping 90% of the capital gain in value of that house. Well, what has enabled you to do that? What's enabled you to do that is the fact that we have the number one school system in the state because of the emphasis we place on supporting our school system, because we have extremely low crime rate. Low crime rate. Of all the towns in Cumberland County, we had, from what I understand, the least number of calls of sending people over to the Cumberland County Jail this past year. It's a testament to the good work our police force does here in town in taking care of the, what crime we do have. Low crime, good municipal services, great school system, that is why people pay $400,000 for an average home in Cape Elizabeth. That is why our house values are where they are. That's why they have gone from, I talked to one resident the other night, he bought his house for $22,000, the house is now valued over $300,000, you know, just 15, 18 years later. You've gotten good value for your money at $15 per thousand. Um, to take that and risk making a couple hundred dollars more per year at the risk of degrading our school system at the risk of diminishing our police and fire protection, which will then directly impact the housing values in our town, the towns around us. Where is the gain in that? If you're looking at it from a short term, yeah, you'll get a few more dollars in your pocket. But over the long term, a lack of dedication to education will decrease the abilities of the workforce here in Maine, will decrease economic activity in Maine, which will decrease demand, decrease the values of your home. These homes are your nest eggs. Whether you intend on selling them in the short term or leaving them to your family, it makes sense of self-preservation to maintain the values in those homes. I have a lot of empathy for a lot of people that live along the coast that feel they're being overtaxed. The market drives the value of those homes, not the town council. We need to be fair to all the residents and tax them equally. We can't give people along the coast a big tax break uh, and then not and then and tax someone further from the coast uh, disproportionately. That That's not within our bailiwick. Uh, next item, you, uh, Councillor Backer said we were looking at a $4.4 million potential decrease. 
having gone through the last budget cycle, we were fighting over ways to find a couple thousand dollars here and there to cut from the budget. I can't even imagine what it would take to cut 4.4 million from the budget. Uh, and my last comment, so that article in the paper this morning, no way. Do not count on the state for sending us one additional dollar. They have a $750 million structural gap going into the next fiscal budget. They have to find ways to bridge that gap. They're not going to send us a penny. Uh, and anyone that's saying, well, we're going to vote this in to send a message to Augusta, not sending a message to Augusta. This is a local issue. You want to send a message to Augusta, elect people to send them to Augusta that are going to make changes, whoever you feel those people might be. But don't think that the Pulaski tax cap is sending a message to Augusta, because it's not. It's just injuring your local government, your local control. And I, I've said enough, so. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, um, I just will briefly weigh in myself because I do have the privilege of speaking last. Um, I disagree with Councillor McGinty that um, the uh, this would that there are scare tactics involved. I think Councillor Lynch mentioned the tax cap task force spent the spring and the summer trying to very carefully evaluate what would happen to our town um, if the Pulaski Initiative passed. And because they were trying not to scare people, they voted as a group uh, and had consensus that the loss, the presumed loss, would be four and a half million dollars out of Cape Elizabeth's budget. Well, as written, if Pulaski does pass, it'll be a nine million dollar budget loss. And so I think the task cap task force was definitely not trying to scare people. They were trying to think what would reasonably be the right number to assume that we would lose. So, and secondly, on scare tactics, I have to respond since I was the I was the person who wrote an email to the lady who was concerned about the traffic on Shore Road by Fort Williams. And as I said in my email to her, I share her concern. It's a, it's a sin sincere concern, and it's a difficult issue. However, I did share, she also wanted to know if we could not only have a sign there, but if we could pave a sidewalk the length of Shore Road between the two entrances to Fort Williams. And that would be significantly more than 26 bucks or whatever the sign would cost. Um, so when I responded to her, I told her I did share her concern because um, I'm sure every, everyone on this council would be um, concerned because I'm a parent and I, you know, I care as corny as that sounds, but it's not scare tactic, tactics to respond that we, I don't see us having the money to do things like that right now. I think it's fiscal prudence, not scare tactics, to plan ahead, as Councillor Roberts said, that if indeed the Pulaski Initiative were to pass, there are things that would have to happen in this year's budget to help us plan for dealing with the gigantic cuts we would face in next year's budget. And among those are unemployment costs. Um, given that 50% of the town's budget and 75% of the school department's budget are personnel related, I can't see how you can cut four and a half million dollars out of a $26 million budget and not have that impact personnel. As much as we would like to say we could restrict it to buying fewer school supplies or not as many books at the library or um, you know, not doing capital improvements, there is no way with 75% of the school's budget being personnel related and 50% of the municipal budget being personnel related, there is no way that we're not talking about people's jobs. And when we talk about people's jobs, we're talking about services that I think that I hear on a weekly, if not daily basis from citizens that they value. Uh, the, the manager, spoke of 2,000 individuals, that's almost a quarter of the population of Cape Elizabeth, signed up for community services programs this fall. I'm astounded by that. I'm pleased because it's obvious they're doing a great job. But those are all things that we have to pay for. And right now, they're not completely <coughs> supported. So I don't believe this is scare tactics. I think the task force has been measured. And I think my response to the lady with her legitimate concern about traffic safety. I think that was not scare tactics either. I think it was just fiscal prudence and reality. Um, 
I will be supporting this resolution. I urge everyone to vote no in November on the Polisky Initiative. I think it will reduce vital services to Cape people in Cape Elizabeth and across the state, but I'm elected to represent the people of Cape Elizabeth's interests. It will reduce vital services. I think it will shift taxes um, from the local level to the state trying to pay for things as much as I know, I don't know where they're going to come up with the money, but they will have to look to other ways to tax people, which is basically sales and income taxes. And I think it's unfair to uh, that there is no local override for this. I see from the great response to the building, uh, the school building projects a year or so ago, that citizens of Cape Elizabeth are willing to put their money where their mouth is. They are willing to pay for services, but this won't even let them do that if they want to. Um, it will take a two-thirds vote to change Pulaski. There's a lot in that four pages of fine print. 34% of the people statewide will be able to dictate what we in Cape Elizabeth do, and I think that's anti-democratic. I, I have many problems with this bill, but I think it is fundamentally anti-democratic. I think it's bad for the state. I think it's bad for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, especially the citizens who are the least able to afford private user fees. It, this will hit hard at people who aren't well-to-do. And the people who benefit most from the Pulaski Initiative are the 20% of property owners in the state that live out of state. And they're not going to care if the roads get plowed in the winter because most of them own summer property. And I don't see why we should be giving them a big tax break and putting it, the cost of paying for vital services on the backs of the working families of Maine. So I urge us all to get out and vote no. And for that reason, I will be supporting this first resolution. And uh, thank you for listening. I get a little heated up when I talk about this, but I'm really passionate about this. So I'd like to move the question. And remember that a yes vote on this is urging the um, a no vote on the Pulaski Initiative. So um, perhaps we could have worded it uh, more clearly, but um, all those in favor of this res res resolution. I almost said revolution. <laughs> resolution. It's six. All opposed? Councilor McGinty is opposed. It passes 6-1. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's comments. Um, and I know that we're lengthy, but I think this is one of the most important things that we will all do and decide on in our time as counselors and in our time of living in this state. So I think it, it uh, was worthwhile having the discussion. We have a second tax-related resolution in front of us. Do I hear a motion on that one? Councilor Moore. Yes, I'd like to make a motion. And. Uh then I'm going to amend the motion slightly, but I'm going to make a motion. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to uh, make a resolution that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council pledges that if the Pulaski Initiative is defeated, the council will use to reduce property taxes of property owners in Cape Elizabeth 100% of any net additional revenue that the town receives from the state as a result of the June 2004 statewide school funding referendum. However, if the Pulaski Initiative is approved, any net additional revenue that the town receives from the state as a result of the June 2004 statewide school funding referendum will in whole or in part be utilized for maintaining existing school programs and services to mitigate the loss of property tax revenue. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Now, um, I would... I was, as, yeah, I was I thought you were going to do a wording change, but that is well, as it was worded. Yeah, so I, I want to make sure I understand. Okay. Now I'd like to request the wording change. Okay. Okay, there was a couple of words that I thought were kind of transposed. Uh, it says in that very first sentence, Cape Elizabeth Town Council pledges that if the Pulaski Initiative is defeated, the council will use to reduce the property taxes of property owners in Cape Elizabeth 100% of any net additional revenue that the town receives from the state as a result of the June 2004 statewide school funding referendum. Uh, just purely flow of the way it's written doesn't change the meaning, but I would prefer to see it say Cape Elizabeth Town Council pledges that if the Pulaski Initiative is defeated, 
the council will use 100 percent of any net additional revenue that the town receives from the state as a result of the June 2004 statewide school funding referendum to reduce the property taxes of property owners in Cape Elizabeth. It just okay. appeared to me that those... So you're not getting at... It, there's no meaning change. It is just no. how it is worded. I just... Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know who seconded... I did. Will you, uh, yeah, will you approve that yeah. second... Um, <laughs> so it's... Yeah. Discussion. It's time for discussion. Councilor Roberts. I guess the question, and Councilor Lynch brought it up earlier, um, assuming that we get $20 from the state for education uh, the, from this, but we lose $40 in our general revenue sharing, shouldn't some of that money go to help maintain existing town services as well as school services? And this thing here just said it's we go totally towards the schools, but if the town loses money because of the the bond issue in June. I, I think the way it is worded, it says net additional revenue that the town receives from the state. And I think that is intended. If the manager it's, could address it. It's the intent is whatever the council says the intent is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, 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 will, it could, in fact, be a difficult calculation. Uh, and what I mentioned, what I think in particular, you know, the, it's 55% statewide. One of the big issues is state retirement for teachers. And right now, the school's picking up 100% of that. If they shifted that onto the formula, uh, you know, that could be a, a major hit on Cape Elizabeth. So, you know, it, it, the, the language, I think, is fine as, as Councilor Moles has, has revised it. But the calculation of the 100% will need to be carefully done and will need to be carefully shown to the citizens uh, so that they understand it and hopefully that we get it right in understanding it as well because uh, uh, the net is, is, a, is a key issue. Uh, when all the shuffling occurs. Okay. Part of that but, chaos and confusion. <laughs> Councilor Fritz? But I had the same uh, feeling that the money shouldn't just go to maintain existing school programs, but school and municipal services, right? I mean, I think we have to weigh all of that. Well. Councilor McGinty. But the referendum was the fund school, the school funding referendum. Now, how you massage that in the budget process, um, you know, uh, it remains to be seen as the, uh, as the town manager said, you know, that's kind of at the discretion of the town council, but that's what the, that's what that referendum said, that money, school funding money, so. Councilor Moles? Yes. As you pointed out, it is a difficult item to calculate. But I think the point that we're trying to get here and get out to the citizens is that in passing this school referendum in June, our effort is to get more funding from Augusta back into Cape Elizabeth so that we can then give that out as property tax relief. As a council, when we put our budget together, we make a commitment to the school department of so many dollars. We make a commitment to the town municipal side of so many dollars. Then we subtract from those commitments what we're getting in from the state for additional school subsidy, what we're getting from the state for additional municipal subsidy, and the resulting is what ends up going to the taxpayers, their burden. So in, in, in reality, we have made, aside from what Augusta is doing, we've made a commitment to the education. Now, when we get back the tax dollars, it all comes into the same pot, and then we subtract it out, and we send out what's left to go to the taxpayers. So regardless of what they do, we're gonna be dealing with a net amount. And the goal here is to say, we're committed to using these dollars for tax relief. Now, maybe we need to make some changes in here to say that more eloquently. Um, or just pass it as it is. Okay. Anybody else have any comments? Okay. Um, then let's move the question. As amended, the wording changed, but no meaning change. It's basically the same meaning as, uh, as before. All those in favor? Seven. None opposed. It's unanimous. Thank you very much.
And lastly, we have a third resolution in front of us that is tax related. Do I hear a motion? Madam Chair. Councilor Lynch. I move that we adopt the following resolution. Resolved the currently elected members of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council individually commit themselves to limit spending in the next three years to a level not more than the rate of the consumer price index with the exception of voter approved debt and an allowance for additional school enrollment and population growth. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I just had a question. Yes. And additional school enrollment is easy enough to determine. I mean, they know how many kids they have in the school. The population growth, how was that to be calculated? Um, are we able to track that on a, on a year? I mean, census every 10 years, but are we able to track that closely? Mr. Manager? It would be a derivative of the number of new housing units and the, the valuation growth from new construction, as opposed to, we, we don't, you know, there's population estimates that come out of it every year from the, not every year, from the Bureau of the Census, but they're, they're really sketchy. So you really got to look at new housing new streets. So there'd be a calculation that would be presented to the council in, uh, in making that determination and then the council would agree whether or not to accept that determination. If you notice the way this is wording too, it, it's to a level not more than the rate. So, you know, if, if folks disagreed with the calculation, they could obviously, in their individual places, this thing is worded saying, well, then I don't agree with that calculation. Other, other comments? Um, I, yeah. I, I have just a brief comment, and, and I, I realize it's getting late, but I had occasion to talk to a number of citizens about these three resolutions um, over the weekend, and this one in particular seemed to engender the most discussion among the citizens that I was talking to and listening to, so I just wanted to take a minute to state my reasons for supporting it. Um, I think this resolution is in response to our earlier resolution opposing the Pulaski tax cap. The tax cap was, as we all know, born out of frustration of the voters over the present tax situation in the state of Maine. There's no denying that the state of Maine has a tax problem. And some would say there's no denying that the state of Maine has a spending problem. Um, the pain that people feel about taxes, property taxes, income taxes, is real. And I feel that it is uh, somewhat, uh, I'm not sure the right word, but um, simplistic of me to just suggest to people that they not vote for Pulaski. It seems to me that as a town councilor, as a town official, I owe them uh, a response to what I will do as a town official um, if Pulaski doesn't pass to provide them with the tax relief that at least 100,000 Maine citizens have said they want. Um, and so this uh, resolution, I guess, along with the previous resolution committing to flow back any additional state funding for education is my answer to, if not Pulaski, what? Um, I think that um, it's important for us to make a commitment to um, the citizens, and the only way I know to do that is to limit spending. I think if we limit spending to the consumer price index um, and we have additional state funding for education, we will be providing real tax relief to um, uh, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth over the next three years, so um, I'll be supporting it for that reason. Okay. Anybody else? Council Backer? Um, <clears throat> I also will be supporting this. Um, for us to commit to applying any additional school revenues that might come from the June 2004 referendum uh, to the reduction of property taxes, um, yet not at the same time promise to limit our own spending, creates somewhat of a misleading um, commitment 
by the council for us to say, yes, any additional monies that we receive from the state, we will apply toward reduction of taxes and then turn around and raise taxes by some other larger amount um, <coughs> does nothing for the voters. Um, just as importantly, we always think about Augusta and we think about Washington as taking our tax dollars. Yet we as members of the town council have just as much of an influence over what people have left as disposable dollars at the end of the year as Augusta and Washington when, we, uh, when it's time for us to put our budget together. So I think it makes all the sense in the world for all of us who feel like we're spending um, and committing way too many of our earned dollars in taxes, um, it's our obligation to try and provide that relief. And we have, I think it comes first and foremost here, and then we can look to Augusta and we can complain, and we can look to Washington to, and complain. But if we don't do it here first, we have no business complaining when Washington and Augusta raise our taxes. So I support this. Thank you. Councilor Moles, did you have some comments? When, uh, when we were looking at these resolutions over the weekend, this was the resolution, the way it was worded previously to this, that I had the most difficulty with getting my hands around and seeing if it was written properly and, and what the long-term effect was this was going to be. Uh, upon serious reflection of our tax situation, of what we're going to be looking at over the next several years, and in an effort to try and find a way to make that previous resolution meaningful, you know, to provide tax relief to the citizens, then to do that, we really can do that no other way than to say that, yeah, for the next, you know, at least while I'm on the council, I can't speak for what happens after I'm off the council, but I'm committed to voting for very small, if not flat, <laughs> increases in the town spending. Uh, so that we can get those tax dollars back. There are occasions when you do need to spend money. There are occasions if we have a contractual obligation or if some emergency arises in the town that we'll have to spend the tax dollars for. But I think in response to those citizens that are going to vote for the tax cap out of frustration, out of true need, we need to respond to that true need by saying, yes, we hear you. We are committing to keep town spending down, as our town has done for many years compared to the towns around us, which is why our budget had to go up so much this past cycle, because a number of items snowballed that we hadn't addressed in earlier years and had to spend money on, which we would rather have not have in the face of this Pulaski referendum. So I'm going to support this resolution. I'm going to support telling the residents that we're not trying to buy your vote. We're not trying to tell you, um, you know, don't, for, don't vote for Pulaski and we're going to do this for you. We're going to do this anyways. We're going to keep our budget as tight as possible. Not because we don't want you to vote for Pulaski, because this is how we're going to provide back the meaningful tax relief that we propose to when we ask you to vote in favor of increasing the school funding spending to bring that so we can pass that on to the taxpayers. Thanks. Thank you. Comments from this side? Yeah, Councillor Roberts. I'm no fool. Well, I uh, fell a hat in the job, but he went first on the first one. <laughs> 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 and I'm not planning on voting for this one, so I thought I'd wait till the end. But my, my concerns with this one is that if the voters of Cape Elizabeth overwhelmingly vote against Pulaski, and they say, we like our town, and we, we want the services, and we're, yet we're turning out and saying, we're going to limit the expenses to that without knowing ahead of time what other mandates may be coming down the road from the feds, what other emergencies may be cropping up in town. The, the road system may go to H in a handbasket, for all we know, because we know we've been out of funding it for a number of years. I would... I give my pledge also that I would work my level best to keep the taxes as low as possible. But I don't think it is correct to state 
that we're going to use a 1% CIP. When a CIP, or not CIP, but consumer price index, yeah, it is a CIP. CPI. Um, when that le scale or level, or whatever you want to call it, does not reflect governmental services. That's what it takes to run a, a, an average household for a family. I don't know many families that are paving roads, rebuild, rebuilding sewers, uh, sending their, uh, all of their waste to regional waste and paying Cumberland County taxes. They're doing it through this, but that's, reflect, that's reflected in, this, in the CPI. They don't have to run police departments. They don't have to run a school that uh, the town has to run. These, these items, our costs are not the same as the CPI. And I am very concerned that something's going to happen between now and three years from now that we have no way of knowing. And consequently, we're not going to know and we cannot tell anybody tonight what we would cut to keep that 1% pledge or whatever the amount might be in order to uh, meet that. What, what other service or what other people are going to have to go if we're going to keep that pledge? And for that reason, the best I can do is state I will work my backside off to try to keep the taxes as low as possible, but I'm not going to buy into a, an artificial level not knowing what's happening in the next three years. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment? Councilor Fritz? I guess I'd, I, I think that with, with the rate of inflation, which is really what we tried to do in the last couple of years as goals, um, for, for the budget, um, but with the exceptions, if we had something really major, it could be borrowed if it were passed by the voters by two thirds. Um, that that's what's supposed to be passed. But um, but with the allowance that there could be additional school enrollment or additional population that might in um, <laughs> That meaning that we had more municipal services, we needed to offer for the uh, increased population growth. It seems that that covers that issue. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. Is Councilor Moll? Um, I thought it was would be fair if I make a couple quick additional comments. Um, with great respect for Jack Roberts' comments, because I echoed those same comments over the weekend to other counselors and how I responded to the, the first way this particular resolution was put forward. And I, I too was very concerned, concerned about our capital improvement projects and the road projects that aren't getting done because we're trying to be fiscally responsible. Uh, perhaps some of those projects need to be bundled together and presented to the taxpayers for their evaluation uh, as a as a vote on a capital improvement. And if they feel it's something that needs to be done, then they'll support it at the ballot box as opposed to a regular town budget uh, item. Um, so I think, I think it could be, could be addressed in that manner. But I also think, to, to stress again, I want the people that are planning on voting for the Pulaski tax cap to know that we hear them. And this is how we show that we hear them. Because if we don't show them that we hear them, then at some point they will vote for a tax cap measure which will take our local control away from being able to decide how much we can spend each year. And this is, you know, uh, how we respectfully show the citizens that we, we hear them, we're listening, and we are going to make cuts. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. I will be supporting this one also for reasons that have already been said by other counselors. Shall we move the question? All those in favor of this spending cap over the next three years? Say aye or raise your hand. Six opposed? Councilor Roberts. Thank you very much. Well, this has been lengthy, but as I said before, I think um, these are among the most important things we will do as counselors and among the most important issues that will be facing citizens when they go into the polling places in November. And so I think it was 
a topic worthy of the time. But moving on, item number 46, um, voter ratification of municipal debt. And this is related to the Kleski vote, um, but I will ask the manager to introduce this because it is a complex subject. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, one of the issues in the Plesky tax cap initiative is that any, she's trying to get her hands around debt for municipalities and the debt approval process. Right now, the debt approval process is determined by a charter in each and every community. I was determined with the Charter Review Commission and the citizens determined how, how to what extent the, the voters should approve debt, to what extent the councilors should approve debt. In the case of the, this new tax cap proposal, which would be the law if it's passed, uh, law if passed, uh, it was drafted actually quite a few years ago before, you know, when Mrs. Pileski first got started on this thing, you know, it was back five or six years ago, and then she ran into all sorts of problems we won't go into tonight. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> one of the issues was that she tried to say, from really the time that she thought the thing was going to be voted upon, that from then on it ought to be voter approved debt. Well, she thought this thing was going to be voted on in 2000 before they said some of her signatures were no longer valid because of the way they had been signed. Uh, so anyway, so but that too, and what she wrote there was that if the debt was July 1 of 99 uh, or before, and that it was exempt from the cap. However, anything after July 1, 99, not only was not exempt from the cap, however, it could be exempt from the cap if it got two-thirds of the voters in a general election. And we looked at that, we looked at our numbers, and we thought, mm, that's good, and we looked to see what had been approved in November, assuming November was a general election. And lo and behold, I, I went to a, a session that Bernstein, Shirofler, and Nelson put on, the Fulton Law Firm, and they said, you guys are reading this wrong. A general election under the state statute is only a November election in even numbered years. It's not what we have in the years that end in 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. And we looked at this again, and the voters in Cape Elizabeth last year, by, seven, by a 70% margin, with a 62% voter turnout, approved about uh, $9 million in new debt. Suddenly, that's not exempt from the cap. So while we've been saying four and a half million and nine, if we get that other whole mess with the uh, what, what valuation to determine, it's actually five million and nine and a half. We've been going all over. This is more of the confusion with, with Carol Pileski. So you know we're we're shrugging our shoulders. You know what are we going to do about this? And you know it's another five hundred thousand dollar problem. And, you know it seems so unfair because the voters by seventy percent wanted to get do it. Uh, you know, suddenly out of the blue, a letter arrived from Bruce Cogdall, who's our, who's our bond counsel, saying, you know, uh, you ought to look, Cape Elizabeth, at what Bangor's considering, at what Portland's considering, and ultimately at a lot of other communities have considered, and that is to give your citizens an opportunity to ratify the debt. And the question is, well, why are you doing it now? Why are you rushing this onto the ballot? The problem is, under the wording of the, the, the Plesky Initiative, if we don't do it this November, we can't do it again for the two years from now, <laughs> because you can only do it in the November of even number years. So that's why, you know, in, in, you know, the ballots have got to be printed right away. So this is something that's got to move ahead. Uh, you know, the, the, the point, the point that really this comes down to is this would enable Cape Elizabeth citizens to determine by a two-thirds vote when they vote in November to exempt all previous debt, whether they had voted on it, whether the council had voted on it, or whether they voted on it in November of an even numbered year or November of an odd numbered year, to exempt off from the cap. Earlier, we were we were thinking in the mailing that went out to the Q and A or the, the thing from the tax cap, said it was a dollar fifty. That was when we assumed the five hundred thousand and five hundred fifty annual payments from the school thing was voted next year was uh, was exempt from the cap. Well. It, it's actually, if you move that back out, it reduces the dollar fifty down to uh, sixty-eight cents. But if you wrap it all around, it, it's it's a dollar uh, eighty-three. So instead of a ten-dollar cap, you have an eleven eighty-three. By authorizing this to go on the ballot, the count, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth who are voting in November would have an opportunity to decide if their cap is ten dollars or their cap 
is 1183 by ratifying all of this debt. And this is a very confusing issue, and I had a discussion with the town clerk as well as with the chairman about it. What we'd like to do is every so often we have to purge the voter list, and what we'd like to do is use the opportunity, because you have to send it by first class mail, a letter to every voter saying, this is how you register to vote. Like, excuse me, this is how someone in your house wishes to register to vote, going to register to vote. This is, uh, this is how you vote absentee. We're going to have uh, something set up here for a couple weeks before the election. These are the dates. We really encourage you to vote absentee. This is the time to come in. We're going to say, oh, by the way, you're voting on, a, on when the municipal election is going to be. Uh, and by the way, you're also going to be voting on this issue with an explanation of these two issues and a little bit of rationale. It won't come from the clerk because she's the voting thing. And someone can say there's arguments there. Yeah. But the rationale of, of what the impact of, you know, why the, the election date is there without, and making clear that there's disagreement on it and what the two sides are. And on this one, making very clear that it's a dollar eighty three impact. But so the citizens really know what they have, have a chance to know what they're voting on, and in it, in it it'll be you know very straightforward, very you know easy out, and it, it also has the great great added advantage of really not costing the town any additional money to do because of uh, it's, it's part of the voter purge list anyway. So we'll get all the mailings back of all those folks no longer this year. So uh, I would hope that you would authorize that. Uh, Bruce Cogswell actually we we. We draft something that we use the tool that could be approved in the end as our bond council that explains it all. There'd be a certification here so everyone sees the debt. But uh, all the numbers are there on the sheet. So did everyone get that tonight? But you can see the impact. And I, I don't think I emailed it to the yet, but I'll do that. This, yeah, no, this sheet here that lays out the buck, the buck 83. You get that? Um, probably in the it's folder. In the, it's in the folder. Oh, yeah, it might be in the folder. So you, you have all those numbers and what the, what the real impact is. So thank you, Madam. Okay, so this would make clear to the voters that they are not voting on any new or additional <coughs> debt. They are just authorizing, for lack of a better word, yeah. the debt ratifying. that is ratifying the previous debt that was already authorized, but maybe at the wrong, during the wrong year for the general election exactly. or by the council. Just a quick council comment on, on the manager's comment. Uh, yeah, it needs to be very clear that this is not an additional dollar right. eighty-three on top right. of everything. Right. Mm -hmm. It is a dollar eighty-three yeah. on top of the ten, but we'll make. But no, yeah. but it's not additional. No, no new debt. Not no new. No new. No new. No debt. new items. No new projects. No yeah. new. And if, stuff. if I might, Madam Chairman, if you notice on the treasurer's certificate, which is attached to Bruce Cogswell's letter, it'll actually be underlined on the ballot. This treasurer's certificate will appear on the ballot. And it will read. It does. It does not authorize any new debt. This statement will appear there on the ballot, and and will not increase their taxes. Well, we we can't say that because the Pleski thing passes. It does, in fact, allow the cap to be a dollar eighty-three higher than it would otherwise be. Otherwise, perhaps, depending on what the legislature does. In you know, the legislature might say, oh. You know, they read Phil Harriman's comments in the Lewis and Daily Sun, and oh, we did, you know, we really didn't mean for this to, you know, we'll try to get the legislature to change this, but I think as Council Moses, no one knows what the legislature is going to do. This would give us some, some certainty and clarification. So if this were not ratified by the voters, then this dollar eighty-three worth of debt, debt, uh, service payment, would have to come from within the ten dollar cap. We would need to cut five million and instead of four and a half million, okay. or if the, the whole valuation thing doesn't happen, nine and a half million instead of nine. Okay. Councilor Robertson. Basically, that was my question I had to the manager. When you were speaking, you talked like the four million, five million, but in reality, what we're talking is 1185, if the voters approve that. Um, but if they don't, we're talking in reality $8.17 to run municipal and school services because the debt is built in there. Instead of 10. No. No? We're talking 1068. If this was approved, we're talking 1183 if it's not approved. If, uh, excuse me, I said no, it the wrong way. Wait a minute. It's 1183 if the voters ratify the debt. Correct. Yeah. If they, they don't ratify the debt, the old debt that's still under the cap uh, still holds. Some of it can which still is, be Which is 68 cents worth. 
So it'd be 1068. It's the swing between 1068 and 1188. But the to, issue that is you have to reduce. pay, we're legally obligated to pay all that debt it. service regardless. So instead of paying for the, the difference outside of the cap, that difference would be underneath the $10. See what I mean? That's why we this is why we need a letter, because it's mm. confusing. Yeah. Councilor Fritz. I'll wait for the letter. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Fritz. Do we, do we need to have the treasurer's certificate? I think the, the most confusing thing that I got in the packet was the treasurer's certificate. I mean, I don't think that's understandable at all. And if that's what the voters are coping with on the ballot, from my, if I, Carol, hint the question. According to state law, the treasurer has to have a certification that lists the intent, that indicates the total amount of debt, that indicates what's issued and what is unissued. And unfortunately, because of last year's vote and the two phase thing that's complicated in Cape Elizabeth, we have to indicate what the interest and principal costs are under the, which is the fourth paragraph. And then, you know, we have to also reveal so that it could potentially apply to the noble laughing that we have to provide that. Th this is required to be on the ballot under state law. And, and we, we could have even made it more confusing under paragraph four because we, we, we thought of putting a couple other sentences in saying, oh, but by the way, some of this new school debt were actually paying down from the principal and interest during this fiscal year. And we, we uh, it's getting even more basically it's required by law to have all these numbers and that's a, in my opinion why we need a letter I mean I, I think that the, the chart that's on the agenda whether it's all up to date or not is, is something clear to understand um, although I was I, I did have a question on whether number five in the treasure certificate is included in that chart in other words, Cumberland County, Portland Water District, and Regional Waste, is that? The contingent and overlapping debt is not in this chart. Should it be? I mean... I don't know all the dates. This was just background for the council right. in the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at. but I mean, this was rather clear. Yeah. Um, and it shows what the percentage of votes were and, and all that sort of thing that makes a lot of sense. I think the letter will have to be drafted very carefully because it's a very complex subject. But the basic message is that this is not authorizing anything new. This is just saying it's okay to pay the debt that we're already legally having to pay anyway. But also yeah. that, that we really need that off vote, the two-thirds vote yes. in November is important to have yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Mould. I don't believe we've made a motion on this yet. Um, in the meantime, though, I do have a question while we're waiting for someone to make a motion on this. And that is, do the citizens need to ratify this by a two-thirds majority for it to count? That's yeah. correct. But we need to make that mm -hmm. clear to them in the letter that we sent. And I think that's kind of an iffy thing. If um, you know, if 45% of the citizens are for the tax cap, you might not get your two-thirds majority on this. So that Then the citizens will live success. with the consequences, yeah. as will we all. Yeah. Councilor Backer. I'm prepared to make a motion. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I move that the council uh, direct the inclusion on the November 2, 2004 municipal election <laughs> Um, a ballot question reading as follows, shall the town of Cape Elizabeth's currently outstanding and authorized debt, which has not previously been approved by the voters in a general election, including direct debt of $25,189,962, and all contingent debt and overlapping debt be ratified and approved? Do I hear a second? Second. I moved and seconded. I, I don't know. Is there further discussion? Yeah. I just want to say I think uh, I commend the town manager for putting this together. Um, I think it's a great defensive position for, from, you know, for our debt from the Pulaski, uh, potential Pulaski passing. I was kind of skeptical. I read about it in the paper first, I think, when Portland was discussing doing this and having 
seen what the South Portland uh, uh, City Council was talking about amending their charter to get out from under the OFD initiative. I was kind of skeptical at first, but I think town manager's done a great job of putting this together. Uh, I can pretty much understand it. Not entirely all the numbers where they fit in, but I understand the general concept. As I said, I think it's a great idea, and I commend the manager for putting it together. Any further comments? Then let's move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the manager um, myself. I think that was I'd like to thank a the good bond explanation. Council. Yes. The bond council as well. Yes. Good explanation of a very complex subject. I hope we do as well in explaining it to the citizens. Okay. Item number 47, having to do with approval of the school project interest free loan. Do I hear a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion. I motion that we approve the acceptance of the million dollars interest free from the main school revolving renovation fund. We don't get to say that too many times here in Cape Elizabeth, do we? Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Does, does it matter that the order says up to or not to exceed a million dollars? Is that an issue? The, the, the minutes will reflect the, all the verbiage here. The second page lays out the, the full verbiage. The second page of our... Well, just that it isn't a million dollars. It's yes, it's up to. Yes. Yeah. I was just going off what was on the, the summary sheet, so okay. please okay. mean that to include the rest of the uh, okay. write-up. Mr. McGovern? I just want to click, quickly clarify, this is not new debt. This is part of the <laughs> money that the, that the citizens authorized in the non-general election uh, on November 4th, 2003. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, let's move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item is item number 48, setback in the DB zone. Mr. Manager, would you like to address yeah, this? The in by the sea uh, wants to, they have this nice driveway that goes in and there's a canopy and anyone that's ever driven up there, it's really narrow to drive through it. They want to, as part of an expansion plan they have before the planning board, expand that canopy out to make it much more comfortable to drop off. Something we would also like for fire and rescue and every other purpose is to have a little more room there. But in order to do that in the DB zone, they'd be violating the 100-foot the setback. So they've asked us to look at a 50-foot setback. Maureen thinks it's a great idea because it, 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 it avoids having all these dry, huge driveways and, and everything else in front of places by, in, in, in essence, uh, reducing the required setback in the road so it could be close to the road and have a better community deal. So I would encourage you to uh, uh, submit this to the planning board for comment. Is there, is there a motion? motion to refer this to the planning board? Second? Is there a second? Second. A move and seconded. Discussion? Yes. Councilor Mould? I'd like to make a real quick comment and then ask a question. My real quick comment is, yes, I've driven through there and almost hit those pillars because it really is too narrow. And I'm really happy to see them coming forward and asking to expand that uh, front of the building for safety reasons, for convenience reasons, for people to be able to get in and out of there. Uh, the question part is when we, and, and, and also I, I would be amiss if I didn't mention that the Inn by the Sea is a great asset to our community. They consistently donate items to all the nonprofit community fundraisers around town. Uh, they're, they're a really good part of our community and, and deserve our, our uh, attention and approval. Uh, can we send this to the planning board with our thoughts that we would like, whether or not we think this, they should approve that, or will they just feel that we, they should approve it just by the fact that we sent it to them? If I might, uh, I, I need to check the rule. I'm not, I, I do not recall whether or not there's anything in the rules that indicates. Uh, if you want, I can go check it. Well, 
Uh, I, can I just offer, I took the liberty of having looked at this modest change. I called uh, Maureen O'Meara, our town planner today, to say, why do we have to send this to the planning board? Why can't we just approve it? It seems to me so silly to, to create two to three months delay for this very good civic-minded business. And we all have the piece in front of us. And Maureen tells me that state law, another mandate, requires us to send this to the planning board. So I would just like to state for the record that I do think it's a very good idea. I wish we could do it tonight, um, but unfortunately state law requires that it go to the planning board. So let's move. Okay. Anybody? Jeff? Certainly if we all go on record as being very much in favor of this, the word would get back to the planning board. I'm, I'm sure they're all watching <laughs> right now. I'm sure they're glued to their TV sets, so I think the word will come back. Councilor Beck. Um, I have a question for our town manager, if he knows the answer. I was hoping that our town planner might still be here when we got to this. The, uh, is it the, the BB zone, is that what we're referring to? Yes. What else is in the BB zone? Anything? Yeah, the BB zone includes the Inn by the Sea, it includes the farm field that's owned by the Spray Corporation between the Inn by the Sea and the uh, Crescent Beach State Park entrance. It includes a small amount of land, I also believe, where Jordan's Farm Market is and where uh, whatever Rudy's is called now. Uh, two Lights two light Variety. Two Lights light light variety. variety. I believe it also includes that. It's a so, um, so some of those, for example, the Two, when you say two lights bright or something, the, um, across from St. Yeah, Mark's. I mean, that's certainly closer than 100 feet. The two lights general, two lights general store. Yeah, that, that is, that is now closer than, uh, because it predated the school. Um, in looking at the drawing of what's proposed for the expansion of the, the entryway, it doesn't look like they need another 50 feet for that. I can't quite tell from the drawing, but it looks like their expansion is substantially less than 50 feet. Why is why is the request that the setback be reduced by such a large amount for what looks like it may just be a 15 or 20 foot expansion? I believe the the actual request was followed some discussions initially with the planning board at a workshop, and it also reflected some discussions with uh, with the town planner. That if you know that if they were inclined to make a request that uh, you know that they try to make it beneficial not only for them but also other potential uses future in in the BB and I think everyone sense you know that 50 a 50 foot setback is a lot better than a 100 foot setback since there is a feeling in Cape Elizabeth that we don't want a whole lot of parking and other things in front of buildings we prefer them in back of buildings and that the 50 feet would help to accomplish and make that happen. Thank you. If I might ask a quick question, um, over by the cookie jar, for example, the Irving Station, um, they're one of the one of very few gas stations in town. I think there are only three, right? And is there one more? Including Cumberland Yeah. There's three currently. Okay. Um, I have a lot of empathy for them, and the guys that work there, they're the only one without a cover. You know, I, and, I, and the zoning currently prevents them from having a, a cover over their pumps. Yet the other two stations in town, because the VA, the VA yeah. zone cannot be there. Yeah. Right. And my question is, down the road, we ought to think about not that they have it in their current plans. I know they've asked the Irving Corporation for money. There hasn't been money in the budget to to bother approaching the town council for permission to put a cover over that because uh, I've had this discussion uh, with the proprietor, but, you know, uh, this is the kind of thing that, you know, down the road, it's a different zone, it's a BA, but we might want to look at whether they might have the ability to, to put a cover over their pumps like the other two stations in town do. Thank you. I think these are issues that the planning board will be able to figure out, so uh, I think the motion was to refer this 
Was there a motion? I've lost track, yes, mm -hmm. to refer this to the planning board. So let's move the question. The hour is late. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item number 49, correction of an assessment irregularity. The, the assessors had answered specific questions on the amount of the abatement, but this comes before you under the statute uh, that permits you to uh, grant an abatement. The, the assessor can only do it for the current year. If you, you go back additional years, up to three years, it can only be done by the council. We, is, what, what happened was John Higgins, we had a pending court case. He's the principal of Ram's Head, whatever he calls it, and I think you're all aware of that court case. Around the same time that happened, he was also in representing his uncle, uh, Bob, Bob Monks and his aunt, Millie Monks. And what had happened was they filed an appeal and somehow it got slotted away and no hearing, nothing ever got scheduled. And, you know, and technically the statute of limitation has expired on the Board of Assessment Review holding that hearing. The only way it could be corrected was to come back to the council. And we could have said as a matter of law, it was up to you to, to push us and to aggressively ask us to have this hearing. Uh, and you know, we were advised by council of that, to be honest, that you, you, know, you can tell them that this thing's better than a whatever. Uh, but it still, it came back, you know, responsible government, people asked for a hearing, responsible government ought to provide one, and for whatever reason, the revaluation going on, it, it just got overlooked and we feel bad about that. So anyway, uh, we had a discussion amongst the attorneys, we agreed that Mr. Higgins representing the monks would come in and meet with, with Matt. Matt met with Mr. Higgins. He recommends this amount. You can ask him this amount. I didn't get involved in the amount issue. And, but that's the process why this is before you and Matt's being answered this specific on the amount. Okay. Is there a motion? I would move um, an abatement of, the, of taxes in the amount um, as set forth um, under item 490405 in our agenda. Is there a second? Second. Then moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Frisch? I just had one question of your assessor, was whether the amount that's listed in the assessment um, is after the correction. Well, the amount is 356, uh, 356,5500 is the uh, recommended right. amount for abatement, but the overall value of the property would be, and this is not currently, this is from this pre-revaluation number. Approximately one million five hundred seventeen thousand, more or less, would be the overall assessed value. Okay. After, after the reduction. After the change. Any further questions for our assessor? Hearing none, no discussion. Let's move the question. All those in favor? Thank you, Matt. It's unanimous. Thank you. I want to thank our assessor and the manager. I didn't mean to cut you off abruptly before. Great. <laughs> okay. Well, then I didn't cut you off. <laughs> um, item number 50. Proposed Denver Boot Ordinance. Uh, Mr. Manager, I know our police chief is here. I don't know if either one of you wants to introduce this. Yeah, but we'd like the Ordinance Committee to look at this issue and provide a recommendation back to the council. We, we give out quite a few parking tickets, on the, particularly on the screw ground for parking on lawns and parking on roads and whatever and other places in town. And only 33% of the people pay those tickets. The other 66% of the tickets for one page. There's really no strong enforcement mechanism to collect that money. And it seems patently unfair to the 33% of, of citizens who, when they realize that they've uh, done something inappropriate, they pay their ticket. Uh, it just seems unfair to those good, responsible citizens that there's not some recourse against the other 66%. And this recourse against the other 66%, mind you, under this proposal, only comes on the fourth ticket. So they can still you know, decide to walk, you know, to uh, play loose with the, with the uh, parking ticket for the first three. And then they've got to start getting nervous because under this proposal, we'd come by with a Denver booth. We, meaning the police officers, I wouldn't get near the thing. 
Uh, the police officer would, put, would attach this to the tire, uh, the purse, and then before they got that thing disconnected, would, under this proposal, would need to pay all their back due tickets. Plus, they'd also need to uh, pay $50 for the police officer having spent the time putting the scooter on. And that's the proposal. I'd like the ordinance committee to look at it and uh, uh, give it due consideration. Thank you. Do I hear a motion? I'll, I'll move reference to the ordinance committee. Is there a second? I'll second it. Been moved and seconded. Is, uh, is there further discussion? I, I just wanted there was a discrepancy in the information about it and the ordinance or the agenda. It says for four or more taxi tickets, and the other information is of three or more. The the intent is after the third, they have three tickets. On the if they have three tickets in place the, under the draft ordinance, the fourth time that the officer. You know, he, he's suspicious. I think I've ticketed this car before. He calls into the station. Is it true that this car already has three tickets? Yes. He then probably goes back to the station, gets the boot, and places the boot on the car. That's the proposal. <laughs> is there any further Just discussion? for a second. And the motion is just to refer it to the ordinance committee, so I wouldn't think we would need to get into a lot of the merits tonight. Let's let the ordinance committee take a look at it and report back to us. I do have a couple Council questions Robert. though before I vote what I want to send it to the ordinance committee. The fees from parking tickets, does the town realize that or does 100%. that go one hundred percent? And if we decide to put on the Denver boots, do we have to pay for additional police training to put these on properly? <laughs> I say that's sort of tongue in cheek, but no. Well, yeah, when I say no, you know, I would hope we'd spend 10 minutes showing them <laughs> how it would run and off. And we yes, would pay them for that time, but we would not do it in any way that would incur additional overtime. And we'll not be paying any higher worker compensation fees because of bad backs for putting these things on. Yeah, they, they use them in a lot of places. You know, it's just a matter of making sure we, you know, the real thing is to make sure people take parking rules seriously. That, this isn't about the money, although the money helps. It's the fairness of people paying and it's it's making sure that uh, uh, you know particularly now if you know, we, we, I look at insurance claims today we paid out seventeen hundred dollars to someone last year sixteen hundred and seventy nine dollars because they parked illegally in the school bus thing and a school bus hit them and then we ended up having to pay seventeen hundred dollars because they were parked illegally through our insurance claim that's why we need to enforce parking tickets so that that, that folks know that, that this is serious because it's when we don't, you know, the parking rules are there for a reason. Well, Excuse me, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> <Move that away. laughs> Any further discussion? I mean, this is just to refer to the ordinance committee, so I'm not sure in light of the hour we need a lot of discussion on this. But So I'm not hearing any more discussion, thankfully. Uh, all in favor of sending this to the ordinance committee? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Chief will be happy to attend the ordinance committee. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Chief. Item number 51 has to do with a sewer lien release. Mr. Manager, would you like to? Yeah, Deborah Lane has been working with the attorney for CB Partners on this. They were, CB Partners runs, uh, owns some of the apartments down there at Starboard Drive, way down in the corner. Those have been part of a uh, assisted uh, housing program uh, for many, many years, since their creation. And they want to, fortunately, they're going to keep them in that program as, as subsidized housing, the ones way down in the corner. And, uh, but in order to do that, they need to, it's at the point they need to refinance and you lose the tax benefits and the rest of it. So, uh, Debbie uh, looked at all the taxes and sewer lien was paid, should have been released, and it wasn't. She did it, she gets it from time to time. They're a little upset that it held up their closing, so uh, they'd like to see. So your recommendation? Yeah, no money though. To go ahead. Okay. Is there a motion? A move um, that we authorize the town manager to sign the quick claim deed as presented. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion. Hearing none. Let's move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you.
Thank you very much to the assistant town manager for her work on this. Um, item number 52 has to do with the warrant for the November municipal ballot questions. Is there anything our town clerk, Deborah Cabana, would like to say on this? Uh, this is just a formality. Uh, initially, I had provided you with a warrant that did not include the question that I'm going to try to fit on the ballot now was the treasurer's statement. Okay. And uh, there was a copy of that as well in your folder. Basically, the municipal officers need to sign the warrant so that I can post it. Okay. Is there a motion? Right here. Just for my, to, to be clear, in your in your folder is an amended yes. warrant that includes as well in the warrant the proposal to ratify all of that. I'll move approval of the warrant for the November municipal ballot. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Item number 53, approval of warden and deputy warden for the November 2nd, 2004 election. Is there a motion? I'll move approval of uh, the reappointment of Sharon Gower as the warrant, or warden for the November 2nd, 2004 election. In addition, um, uh, the deputy warden the uh, Deborah Cabana. Thank you. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, item number 54, approval of members of the Voter Registration Appeals Board. Is there a motion? I move appointment of uh, the Democratic Committee nom nominees, uh, John Walker, um, and Gregory Toot, uh, I'm sorry, John Walker as the regular member and Greg Toot as the alternate member. And for the Republican Committee, Reed Jones as the regular member and Marjorie Dunham as the alternate member and their addresses are set forth in our package. Is there a second? Second. second. Then moved and seconded. Any discussion? I have just a brief question. I, I note that the, the <laughs> item as is presented to us references is the third member, the chair, oh. must be nominated by the municipal clerk with the approval of the municipal officers. Um, when does that take place? September 29, 2007. The last line says that that chairman's term is, the current chairman's term is not up until 2007. So at our October meeting, Will we be approving? No, it's in 2007. 2007. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. Uh, the hour is late. That's okay. Three years for, now, forget, now. For, forget everything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll forget it. Okay. So it's been moved. Any further discussion? It's been moved and seconded. I hear no discussion. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, item number 55, approval of voting credentials for the MMA annual meeting. This is a form, I'll, I can introduce this or the manager can introduce it. Um, <coughs> there's a proposed bylaw amendment um, to allow for consecutive terms for the MMA executive committee. That's sort of the key vote. There are some changes in the nomination of officers sections. Um, and then we need to designate who will be the voting delegate and who will be the alternate voting delegate for the MMA annual business meeting, which is scheduled to take place <coughs> this October 6th. I, I could mention that as a member of the executive committee, I will be there anyways. And I so I'm, I'm not nominating looking Hannah for a big nomination here, but. <laughs> as the delegate. Okay. Second. And I think we need an alternate. Is there someone else who thinks they're going to be there? I'm not planning on going till Thursday. Is there anyone else? I wasn't going to go 
and the town. Well, if I promise I go, <laughs> can we stick somebody else's name in the alternate? And I promise I'll go. <laughs> so you won't have to. When is it? When is it? It's October Wednesday. It's on a Wednesday, October 6th. At 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, in light of the fact that it appears that Councillor Roberts may be the only other person going, I would nominate him as the alternate. I'll second that nomination. Even if he's only there part of the time. All right. How could you make a meeting? If you can. Yeah. If the chair can't make if it, let me know. This just says who's who's if you the can't, delegate. If you can't make it, you could let me know. you're going right? to be there. Oh, of no, course. But it, but it says the meeting is October 6th at 11 a.m. Yeah. So are you going to be there at 11 a.m. on October 6th? All this says is if who we're saying is our delegates. If they show up or don't show up, it's oh, okay. sort of to be up to them. They're not swearing in blood that they're actually going to be there. Okay, so Jack, you're sure. okay. So, is there a motion for? I did someone thought it one? was moved in. to add Jack. Yes. Okay, I just made that motion. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind here. <laughs> Okay, it's been moved. It's been seconded. Any discussion? I don't hear any. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Sorry, I had a momentary reality lapse there. Okay, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. I don't, oh. Yeah, I just want to quickly uh, thank Deborah Lane and Deborah Cabana for arranging all the activities relating to the Ralph Food Awards presentation this evening, the reception. Uh, that we held, that was held beforehand, that was that was very nice, and we thank Hannaford as well for uh, providing all the refreshments, the bottled water we're still having uh, here this evening, and uh, appreciate the efforts of uh, Deb, the two Debras as well as uh, Hannaford Brothers. And thank you, and I want to thank the manager for your help in putting together those lengthy remarks on Chuck. I had no idea how much the man had accomplished. Um, before we adjourn, I just want to mention that we are having a workshop on Wednesday, the 15th. Um, and the four things on the agenda right now are meeting with our auditors, a discussion of the fund balance policy, an update on RWS, um, and then a follow-up on last month's workshop on town-owned land. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. They're moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Head up to my office.